Major John Spencer serves as the Chair of Urban Warfare Studies at West Point's Modern War Institute and co-director of the Urban Warfare Project. He previously served as the Strategic Planner and Deputy Director of the Modern War Institute, where he was instrumental in the design and the formation of the Institute. John, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Dan. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I'd like to start with the recent news that President Trump will withdraw U.S. troops from Syria and Afghanistan. Is there a case for staying? Does pulling out now leave a dangerous power vacuum? Yeah, so the, so Syria tr- troops being with, withdrawn was announced, and then the Afghanistan troops, you know, that hasn't been made official, and, and even the uh, what has been released was about a half of force reduction. I mean, to talk about Syria is a little bit easier than to talk about our 17-year war or engagement in Afghanistan. Any change in security situation, of course, leads leads to a you know a change. I wouldn't say a security vacuum. I mean, if you want to talk about Syria, it's a. I don't know if there's anything there that would you know cause there to be a vacuum or that's not already there. Of course, the U.S. presence does mean something, but the U.S. I think was. I actually agree with the decision, and I think the U.S. was pretty clear up front why we were there. And as a teacher of strategic studies, you have to look at, you know, why was the U.S. there and why would they stay? I mean, what government would we would be helping if we stayed? Um, clearly, we're not going to help the, the Syrian uh, government. Um, we've already had many statements on disagreeing with his approach to the rule of law, to you know, human humanitarian incidents, and with the Russian backing. And you know, I, I love to, to talk Syria because it is great for in my classes or in my past classes to talk about the complexities of war and the political decisions and all the different actors, whether they're overt actors like Syria, Russia, Israel, or covert in you know, more proxy warfare. Um, Syria is a really bad situation with not a clear ending. Um, but when you talk about nation state involvement, you have to look at their political interest. And I don't think the I agree with American political interests in Syria were from the start to roll back the incredible travesty of ISIS control of Syria and Iraq and I think we accomplished that and yet and I you know I know the news and I know that you, you, you're not going to defeat ISIS you, in the definition of a military victory there is no victory over an ideology it has to be a political outcome militarily ISIS is nothing compared to it was at the, its peak in 2014 the, the, so that's a long, a long answer, Dan, but it's a tough topic. <laughs> the, the concern expressed is that even though they only control 1% of Syria's territory, they still have its estimated 30,000 fighters, although it sounds like they're not terribly sure about that estimate. Can coalition forces still strike ISIS from Iraq to keep pushing back and defeating ISIS in Syria? Absolutely. And, and from you know, unclassified sources, and that's what we're still doing. So we still have American forces within Iraq that are providing artillery and air support to fight against ISIS in Syria. So yeah, so removing troops from within the Syrian borders is one thing, but removing all U.S. support um, is another. Okay. What is your take on Mattis's resignation? How do you understand uh, his recent comments that, quote, storm clouds loom? Yeah, I mean, I actually didn't agree with having retired um, four-star generals, and again, this is all my personal opinion, leading um, national defense, because we have a, we have, in America, we have civilian oversight of our military, and I think there was a, could have been a conflict of interest, but nobody thought that about Mattis, and Mattis is, you know, we call him a unicorn, just in a, a soldier scholar. Um, I agree with him in his recognition letter that it, I mean, he is a civilian, the, the president appointee of the military, so if if their political views um, differ, or you know, they're so different, then he wanted to step away. I, th- I think that's the right decision. Um, the president is the commander in chief, and his national security team. You know, everybody likes to just say this is a big thing between the president and the secretary of defense. And that's not the way our government works. The president has a national security team. Um, he, he has lots of advisors on even military. Uh, so his remo- you know, his resigning. I think the storm cloud, you, know, you can read into that all you want, and I don't know if it was wise for him to put that in there, to put a cryptic message in there. I mean, the, there are lots of storm clouds in the Middle East and in a lot of areas 
that are just uncertain political situations that will nobody knows what's going to happen and, and it's not just a president trump's decisions that's going to affect that i mean nobody know, knows what the end state of syria is um there's there's lots of problems between israel and the neighboring countries i, mean, I, I agree with that but i mean if you look all the way back in history when had there not been storm clouds looming but we are at a i think i agree with him that we're in an inflection of political stability and and things that are going on in the country that we just don't know what the future is. And I think some of the other questions will get to that on like, what do you predict? And for national security people, that's the one thing that you can say we pretty much always get wrong is what's the next fight? What's the next enemy? Uh, what's going to happen? Nobody saw things like 9-11 happening. Nobody saw World War One, World War Two, all those tipping points. There were signs of political instability, but you look across our globe and there's lots of signs of political instability. And that's Really, my area of research is is how that unfolds in in especially urban areas. But I agree there are storm clouds, but I don't think it's a it's a big you know oh no get our helmets you know prepare for the worst. In Afghanistan, what is a realistic goal for our involvement, and what is it going to cost to attain any of those goals? Yeah, so Afghanistan's another you know major topic. I think we talked the whole time about Afghanistan and um, what was the mission. And the missions change, so the U.S. mission in Afghanistan changes. And, and you know whether we've had success in nation building uh, in a country that has never had a, let's say, stable Western ideal of democracy and stable governance, um, but trying to connect all of Afghanistan to a central government is it was a major ask of the United States. I think your know, continued involvement, and I don't think the U.S. will ever, you know, not be involved, but in the ability to help the Afghan government and the Afghan military um, contain um, threats to national security, their own national security. And we always, of course, have interest in, in any enemy force that has an extrajudicial, you know, that wants to strike outside of their own country, like a terrorist organization like Al-Qaeda. Um, we will maintain the ability to strike those forces and assist the government in controlling those forces whenever possible. Uh, we have essentially failed in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, and before that, Vietnam, despite rarely losing any battles over 35 years of conflict in those countries. What is being done on a strategic level to address the American habit of entering and not winning asymmetric wars? Yeah, so that's a, that's a couple books in itself. There, you know, whether we win or lose is its own conversation. War is policy or politics by other means and not to use that guy's saying um, we lose in assisting in counterinsurgencies but because we're a force that really has no involvement in a counterinsurgency once the government has the ability to govern itself and I think that's where we lost in Iraq Iraq was in 2011 when they decided that they did no longer needed US support had stability they had the ability to govern its nation and to provide governance of its own accord. Um, and I think that's that could be viewed as success. And the fact that it unraveled quickly had nothing to do with U.S. involvement. It had to do with de Democratic appointed leaders um, seeking an agenda of sectarian that allowed for the ISIS to re reappear. We did really bad at post-conflict stability. And, that, and the main reason is because the military – that's not their role. The military is to win those battles and to assist in the establishing governments. But yes, you could say that the American military or the American government is really bad at nation building because it is a extremely complex um, task to try to take on when you, you know, whether your presence there is the number one inst thing that's causing instability. So you leave and then the government, there has to be a reestablishment just like Iraq and if we ever left Afghanistan, they have to reestablish themselves without, you know, oversight or to be able to create a nation where they're governing. But yeah, the military, you know, to say that they shouldn't do that anymore. Yeah, we most militaries don't want to do that. Nation building is a thing that we, nobody wants to do because it's it's outside of internationally accepted norms, right? You have a nation that self determination, you know, led us to a lot of this, but it is nations have to govern themselves and that's why there's democracies and we support freedom and democracy everywhere so that people can 
have their own nation and not us be involved in telling them what to do. Okay. How will Western military forces operate in large urban environments, megacities in the future? We saw in Syria how city life continues or tries to continue while the fighting slowly moves through the city. How do we plan to deal with the civilian component from humanitarian aid to the threat of enemy combatants embedded in the civilian population? Yeah, so that's that's my specialty, right? So I'm the chair of urban warfare studies and I study this across time and almost all militaries do this very badly because militaries don't want to fight in an environment where there are civilian populations because of especially Western militaries that adhere to to internationally accepted laws of war that do everything they can to limit civilian and um, destruction in general. And when there's a civilian population, that makes it really hard. So to, to understand how that's going to happen, I look at history and it's going to be con- continue to be extremely messy uh, and destructive. I study a lot on cities itself. I think one thing that all militaries have to do better at is understanding what a city is and how it, how it's surviving as an organism. You know, Mosul gives us the probably the Mosul 2017 gives us the, the biggest case study ever, where you have an enemy force that besieges a city and then you have a large military that has to retake it. But you have to understand how that city actually lives and how it, it provides support to its populations. But I study urban warfare across time and. Since uh, most militaries are designed to kill things and destroy things, they're, all the tools they have available are very destructive. And it really becomes a almost paramilitary operation when you have civil order, you're trying to establish humanitarian lines to get civilians out of the combat areas, as well as defeat enemies who have the advantage. Anybody who seeks to defense in an urban area has the advantage against even the best military in the world like the United States because of being able to embed in buildings, um, strike when they want, use guerrilla tactics. And then I think we'll talk about all the kind of asymmetric things that popped up in recent urban battles. But it's a really bad situation. And even in the United States military, um, and I've written some pieces about this, doesn't focus on it enough because we've always tried to avoid that happening. No military across time has ever wanted to pick a city and then go fight within a city because it's bad for both sides. What coin strategy, tactics, or, or differences do you see between the Russian, Syrian, Iranian coalition in the Syrian civil war versus the U.S. NATO coalition in the conflicts in, say, Iraq and Afghanistan? Yeah, so I think the biggest point that most people will agree is that the Syri- Syrian government with US, Russian backing does not apply the, the counterinsurgency or even laws of war that we do on protecting the populations and um, to include well-documented Syrian government um, targeting of populations, um, which is not done in war and it's against international norms. Um, That's probably the biggest difference. Counterinsurgency for a Western um, coalition, United Nations, it's always protecting the population, getting the population out of violence, protecting the population so that the insurgents can't live within the populations and use the populations um, to their advantage, where a Russian or let's just say a Syrian approach is to not abide by those laws and to target actual civilian populations and attempt to get the insurgents within those populations. Because it's, it's extremely hard. It's extremely hard to separate the insurgent from the population. Do private operations such as uh, Blackwater or now I think it's called She Services or, or whatever new name they're using uh, present useful options for undertaking operations that would present political differences for the government's military? Or are they a dangerously unaccountable wild card that undermines the proper line of command by which military operations are given legitimacy? Yeah, so again, personal opinion here. Um, I'm actually. The, the use of private military contractors has been something that's been across time. Um, and yes, Blackwater um, causes a very bad name for many of those private military contractors, but there are many that are very good and actually help a nation and accomplish kind of minor tasks like escorting um, s- state or security personnel or diplomats. I think they're highly used still in almost, I mean, so many different nations. But yeah, because of the Iraq War, many private military contractors got a bad rap or, or because of some incidents that happened under Blackwater, it has a different name. 
But I think that they have their use. But yes, I agree that when you give them that one task of uh, manage violence and implement violence, it becomes um, very tricky in the laws of war and accountability. Although the, the private military contractors that were occupied in Iraq had actually more stringent rules than the military and, and the Uniform Code of, Code of Military Justice under their contracts. That, that But it does become tricky. But I, mean, you can't, I don't think there's a single conflict out there right now that you can say that doesn't involve contractors and uh, to include armed contractors. And if it turns out that Trump is implementing Eric Prince's plan for Afghanistan, would you be at all optimistic about that or is that just a bad idea? Uh, it's a very, very complex ideal, um, and I don't think anything would be – well, I've seen the news about, and I don't know where that is. I agree with um, – again, Afghanistan now has a lot of contractors, but to reduce the number of active duty soldiers and increase the number of private military contractors causes complexity. But again, it's up to the nation that is – you know that we are supporting, or that who are, if the private contractor is supporting the nation, which happens all around the world, it depends on what's on the details of their contract. But for Blackwater, to, or Blackwater, or a group like Blackwater to come in and do some counterterrorism functions for a government is up to that government. And then that government. So my only advice is that if if that happens, and I agree that it it, it, it gives an immense case of capacity to a government that doesn't have it already that the laws and the contract rules have to be very well defined on what they can and can't do and that they're adhering to the laws of that nation and international laws, which usually happens. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing and I, you're not going to put me on the record saying it's a good thing, um, but I could see how it could be very advantageous to Afghanistan to maintain cap capacity, and even if it's just intelligence capacity, which is one of the things they're offering, as long as they make sure that the contract implies all those rules. The Syrian Kurds were U.S. allies in the fight against ISIS in Syria, and of course we have allies in Afghanistan who we may be leaving behind to some extent. Uh, what kind of effort, diplomatic or otherwise, could be made on their behalf to protect them against retaliation by government forces or, uh, in, in the case of Syria, a Turkish effort at border control? Yeah, I know that's a, a very big topic. I, I wouldn't say that, you know, the Americans leaving people behind or leaving allies behind. I think it just we made our political goals even more clear than that we have before, and that there has to be new political discussions. I mean, a lot of people like to get down to the tactical level, but they have to look at it through the nation's eyes and whether that's a United Nations um, conversation between all countries and you know Syria, Russia, and Turkey are having these conversations with, amongst themselves. Um, and you've seen some of those conferences, and the United States has um, continued to be a part of those conversations. But again, it has to be up to the country. If Syria is a recognized country by the United Nations, and it, it is allowed to govern itself within some aspects, while we're maintaining, and we have said that already, whether that's the last attack of the Ibid in the city of Syria, um, that the, the the world as a whole won't allow for humanitarian crisis to happen, and then we'll, you know, the the conversation will be had again on what's going on there um you know for the kurds it's i'm not an expert in the in the turkish kurdish syrian um you know iranian discussions but it's, it's very complex when you have a separate um sectarian involvement within countries themselves that have been battling for years and then these political wars cause immense instability and we saw that in iraq with kurdistan um, in a renegotiation of political settlements, but that's always has to be the goal is political settlements. So you know our involvement with you know backing of the Kurdish and in fight against ISIS was huge, and they were huge allies. But you know the, the continued Syrian war and the, what happens along the borders of all these countries has to be a political conversation, and we're a part of that conversation. But it doesn't have to be the U.S. backing one side or the other. How will climate change affect future conflicts around the globe? It's been suggested in, a, in at least one recent study that that was partly the cause of the conflict in Syria. Uh, where should we be looking for signs of uh, future climate conflicts? Yeah, so I study a lot of the, the climate change impacts to littoral areas. So most major cities, and I'm not just focused on mega cities, but most major cities are along some type of littoral aspect, which is more people are moving to those areas and as more people move to those areas they become more susceptible to 
the increasing natural disasters that happen because of climate change. Not that anybody can argue that climate climate change is a real thing. I agree it's a huge factor, and especially just look at water. And that's I think that's one of the things that hints to the even the instability in Syria with the water riots. Um, I, I think it's huge, and it's an aspect that all nations, especially ones that are more susceptible to things like droughts and water, um, being able to provide essential services to these growing populations. And that's why I chose to study urban warfare, because as urbanization and population growth has increased across the globe, as um, that's why a lot of political instability has happened in many of these governing nations that were able to govern before. But as these populations grow and the essential services are harder to do, and then you put climate change in there, it all fall, starts to fall apart. And then um, it allows for bad people to be able to contest political power in the area. And I think that's what we've seen because of climate change in a lot of areas. So it's, a, it's I think it's a global conversation about um, identifying which cities are at most risk because of climate change. And there are many, um, whether it's in Africa or whether it's in the Middle East, that because of climate change in these developing worlds, um, political st- instability is on the rise and then intervention has to happen, whether that's you know interventions in water, interventions in living conditions and responding to natural disasters i think i think we've you know we've done a lot there when a natural disaster like a tsunami happens and the globe as a whole will rally together and try to get in there and provide humanitarian aid so that again a conflict zone doesn't be created because of natural disasters okay what is the army's current doctrine on urban warfare how much of what is taught is based on historic urban conflicts like stalingrad and grozny versus what has been learned in Afghanistan and other more recent Middle Eastern conflicts? Yeah, that's a great question, and that's that's what I do. So, I mean, there's two big urban manuals for the U.S. Army, and I can't talk to all armies because NATO, NATO has an urbanization group that has an urban doctrine, and there's we have a joint doctrine, and a lot of people have urban doctrine, but they're actually pretty small manuals because it, people have to understand what doctrine means. The word doctrine actually means not just the books, what's in the books, but also the way that militaries approach combat, what they teach in their schools, what type of equipment they have, all of that. And I agree, most approaches to urban war are either World War II approaches, um, because that's where we saw a lot of big urban battles and we took those lessons um, and we learned a lot, or a post um, Munich Olympic raid, failed raid kind of doctrine where we have to learn how to um, strike into a building um, and, and take down a hostage or take down a, a terrorist cell within a building. Um, but there's a huge gap between you know attacking a city like we did in World War II um, versus the more enter and clear room doctrine that most militaries study for urban warfare. There are very few militaries, I think, that are on the right, that, are, that have it right now, but a lot are, have, because of what's happened in the Middle East, um, even if you take Mosul 2017, the U.S. Army did a huge study trying to see, okay, this is a, a fight we haven't looked, seen in a long time since World War II. And what are the lessons and what are we going to incorporate into our new doctrine? So a lot of militaries are now looking at it pretty hard on what does it mean to fight within a population because that's not normal. It's not normal to have an urban fight within a city where the population is still there. But that's what we saw a lot, a lot in the uh, Aleppo, Mosul, uh, Moari. Um, what we do is try to get everybody out of the city and then have the fight. But that may not be feasible in the future. So the U.S. military is doing a lot of investments in training sites and technologies. And um, the Mosul Studies Group coming out with you know, what's the lessons. But there are a lot of militaries doing that. So I, I think we're on the right movement as we're seeing a lot of these non-state actors choose urban areas as the battlefield and militaries having to be able to go in and engage within populations while protecting the population, um, we're going to see a lot of changes in the near future. Uh, since the U.S. has specialized divisions for things like mountains, should we have specialized units for urban combat? Absolutely. And I've written, I've written about that. I think, um, I definitely think that we need to take a small organization and tailor them to urban and not that um, that one urban unit will be used for all urban fights, but I think if we tailor one urban unit, everything from their equipment, their vehicles, to their doctrine, to the um, experimenting with technologies, that will create new lessons that will apply to other 
units when a major battle happens. But I'm a big believer that we need an we need an urban or I've you know I have an article called the Mega Cities Brigade what it would look like. But <clears throat> that's the thing is most armies are what they call general purpose and they're supposed to be adaptable to all environments, and that's great. And <clears throat> especially the U.S. military, which has a global kind of outlook, they have to be prepared to fight in the jungle, in the mountains of Afghanistan, um, in the Arctic. But we, like you said, we have we don't have specialized units. We have specialized schools. Um, so that all the U.S. Army's brigades are general purpose, and then you have special forces, which are specialized for, for certain type of missions. But I'm a big believer that we – one, we need an urban warfare school, and we need an urban warfare unit. Do we have effective quantitative measures for gauging performance in an urban warfare environment? No, I don't think so, and that's a great point. Um, even civilian casualties, the, 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 met, the metrics of success – Again, you, you you ask a military to come into an urban fight, usually the metric is the enemy is eliminated or you retake the city. But then the estimates, so the, the, the quantity, the let's say the, the metrics are not how much of the city did you destroy and how many civilians were injured. Um, but if we had those metrics, and as somebody who looks at data sets across multiple urban battles, those, those metrics aren't there. And I know a lot of people are working on that, especially in the civilian – um, protection or humanitarian organizations about how to even estimate the casualties of uh, you know, non-combatants, which would be of metrics. Um, but almost all military metrics, again, if you understand what the purpose of the military is, accomplishing the mission to emulate, uh, eliminate the enemy. How have information operations, whether U.S. or foreign, affected geopolitical assessments in your experience? What is most different in your field today than it was when you started working on it? Yeah, that's a tough one. It's a, it's a huge topic, and I, I I do believe it's it's changed a lot, but then some of it stays the same because when we had information operations, you know, you know, it, in, if you're a study urban or even warfare in general, it, it goes back to time. But I think that the de- democratization of technology, especially social media and that type of information operations technology, and the speed of information have changed things. Um, and the use of information operations to change political environments is huge. And a lot of people are – they we're not taken back from it, but they're struggling to figure out what the new norm is where other countries like Russia and China even and other organizations that, that are investing in information operations in, in this aspect of warfare, whether that's Russian use of it before warfare and, and during it, has caused a lot of nations – to one, see if it's internationally acceptable under the laws of rule, if, is it even warfare, um, and how the U.S. is going to approach that because you know, most Western militaries are going to abide by international laws to include the use of information warfare, propaganda, what is a, a attack using information, you know, cyber attack, things like that. that are, it, this, this new environment, especially the information operating environment, is causing – everybody to reassess what is what is right what is acceptable what are we willing to do um and even attribution is so hard in this environment but when you get down to the ground fight and i like i love Mosul 2017 for my studies it, it changed a little bit in the you know they're used to conduct recruitment and to establish their the kind of the what we call the narrative but when it came down to the tactics of you're holding ground, and military is going to take that ground from you. It didn't change that much. Does the U.S. have an edge in urban warfare? And if we do, how close are other powers like Russia and China to closing in on that edge? Yeah, I wouldn't say we, we have an edge in urban warfare at all. Um, if you look at Russia and their experiences in Grozny and the, the lessons they took in second um, Grozny, yeah, it's hard to say because you know, these – Battles didn't pop up as much as they did now. I mean, even for the U.S. military, it wasn't from 1968 in the Battle of Way in Vietnam to, let's say, um, even the the assault into Baghdad or even a worse fight, the Fallujah 2004. That's a huge gap in urban fights. So, you know, most militaries will, will conduct an urban fight and then revert back to training for the big state on state battle on the open plain. And if you want to look at that, look at their training sites. 
So if you look at the training sites of all these different militaries, there are few people that have a military training site in an urban area. Um, the U.S. military has a big one out in the National Training Center. Um, the Israelis have a really big one because they're, you know, they're training for urban combat every day and they live in urban combat. But few militaries are envisioning future fights inside cities, and so none are really have, a say, an advantage over another. There is an advantage in certain capabilities, but I, I, I think that you know it's not an arms race, but most have pre- pretty much similar capabilities because they don't prepare for that fight. What happened to wide area persistent surveillance? Has any progress been made towards this concept? During the Cold War, Soviet doctrine was to avoid cities as much as possible to avoid getting bogged down. Uh, is it more dangerous to have a larger force in a megacity to assure coverage or a better equipped force? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, again, nobody's nobody in their major war games plans to, okay, here's a city, we're going to have a fight within our own city. And that's a big critique of the U.S. military because you know we don't most of we're in, we're a fight over there kind of army. Most of our fights are not there. But if you talk about Russia, Eastern Europe, or European fight, I mean, they're fighting a lot of times on their own ground, and they're not having war games where they're going inside their cities because they don't want to destroy their own cities. So this wide area security thing. I mean, there are some lessons from World War II. Is if you just threaten a city. And you can you may be able to achieve a political outcome that you want using your military, but militaries are used to fight other militaries. They're not used to fight, you know, within cities. Um, but it's something that has reappeared in the continuum of, of conflict. So much so that I wouldn't say that nobody's looking at it. And this wide area security thing, it's you know, if, if somebody's planning a World War Three and would it involve these cities, or would it continue to use the tactic of avoid and bypass? Um, and you have to look at the history. Even Stalingrad, the one that everybody wants to use as the case study, Stalingrad was not supposed to have happened. They were They did not. Neither army planned to have a fight within that that city. Um, it's not the intent of the city. And most of the fight did not happen within the city. I mean, ninety percent of the the battle in Stalingrad Stalingrad was cleared within the first two months, and there was the rest of the battle that unfolded. But the military don't plan for these operations, and I, you know, I'm a big critic that they should. How do you see Russia's range advantage in tube artillery, U.S. counterfire radar precision, and the interaction of tactical AA SA-400 envelopes shaping a modern urban battlefield? Will hypothetical urban warfare between now and 2030 be shaped primarily by smaller specialized units, or will modern forces accept higher losses in collateral damage to contest these urban centers? Yeah, I think it's a great point. The Russian investments in all long-range artillery and it kind of points back to their own history of urban warfare where the, um, you know, they had the first fight in Grozny where they lost more tanks than um, were lost in Berlin in the fight for Berlin. And then the second one where they decided to really blast it with artillery rather than exposing their forces. And I think that's – I think unfortunately that's going to be con- a, a continued um, norm of urban warfare in fights that are going on today in, you know, in Syria that, that went on in Iraq. When you have – yeah, I think that – Russia's investments, you know, it has concerned a lot of people, especially the use of that long-range and thermobaric munitions in Ukraine. Um, I do think it's going to be a continued trend in urban warfare because, and I've written about this, th- there are fewer options to militaries than we've had in the past of how do you get somebody out of a city um, that you want to retake or destroy an enemy within a city because of all the defensive advantages. And artillery is one of the biggest weapons that can penetrate concrete and that's that's really what it boils down to so yes the investments in long-range artilleries um i think are an investment in approaches and not specialized units which can strike um depending on the mission so mission always matters you know, what's the mission in this urban area is it just a you know a, somebody sees the theater um you know artillery is not going to be using that but if it's a more of a non-state actor with military-like capabilities that has taken this urban environment or a state actor that you want to push out of an urban area you know, to seize their territory, then you're going to see a lot more use of artillery because that's one of the fewer weapons that we have that can penetrate country. Traditional military theory would suggest that if you control the countryside, you will control the cities. But a majority of the world's population now live in cities and urban areas. Is traditional theory correct? I, I mean, I personally don't think so, and I think that points to some of the traditional theory of siege warfare. 
Um, and some people have argued that siege warfare is back, and then I think that's yes and no. Yeah, if you controlled the support to a city, you know, which most cities have to get their support, all their um, resources that they need outside of the city and bring it into the city. If you can control that, then you can control the city. And that is a, a big theory of, um, you know, all the way back from the history of urban warfare. But because of the international norms that we have established and that we abide by, you're not going to impose a military strategy on a population. So I think that theory is lacking um, in context of the fights that we've seen and the ones I think we'll see in the future. No military is going to, well, no one that abides by international law, such as the siege warfare, is illegal. Um, and that was really studied after the siege of Sarajevo, Sarajevo um, in that fight, where you're not going to impose a strategy that um, imposes effects on the population. So you can't cut them off of the, all the supplies of the city. You can't surround the city and cut it off from all its supplies. And that's the approach we've seen even in Syria and Iraq. You can surround it, but you've got to establish humanitarian corridors to get people out and to get aid in. Um, and if some of your enemy get out during that time, that, that's the way it is. So for that question, I think, yes, the theories don't apply and they need to be reassessed. And you need new capabilities since that theory doesn't apply and you can't impose a strategy that – um, puts harm on the population. Are there meaningful differences between urban warfare in a moderately urbanized terrain and urban warfare in megacities? As someone who has studied urban warfare extensively, how do you see the rise of megacities changing future warfare? So, yeah, so that's a great question. It comes down to density. So yeah, you can have a fight in an urban area that's not very dense, that poses less challenges um, to, an, uh, to a military. Even a, a city that's set up to where it can can be cut off and controlled, and I like to use the Battle of Sadr City, where it was a you know a city within a city, that it was actually easier to surround it with concrete and to control the entries and exits to reduce the amount of weapons and and military supplies that could go to the enemy for its capability. Megacities is tough because megacities, depending on which megacities, are extremely dense, uh, extremely globally connected. And the effects of military operations are less predictable, and the amount of suffering increases by the amount of density of populations. Any megacity, I mean, I, megacities get a kind of in my studies, uh, it, a lot of people just think it's not possible, but it always depends on what's the mission. Yes, if you have a mission to clear a megacity, every building, every structure, no military has the capacity to do that. But that's not the way it works. What is the what is the enemy threat? What's the size of the enemy? Where is it located? And then what's the mission of the military you're giving? Um, but as you increase that density, you increase the complexity of what you're asking the military to do, the complexity of danger to the civilian population. Even if you remove the civilian population, if you damage the infrastructure that allows that megacity to function, whether it's the water, transportation, the power, all of that, and we've seen that in recent battles, then you're damaging the population. So the complexities of what you're asking the military to do increase. But I don't think that it's impossible to do operations in megacities, even with a small military force. You just have to tell me what the mission is. How can forces effectively combat IEDs and SVB IEDs in an urban setting? Yeah, that's uh, that's a that's a that's an extremely hard one. I, I do believe the IEDs will be continued. I mean, it's a it's a it's a nasty uh, equation between force protection of the soldiers, um, but especially in counterinsurgency operations, which we saw where you have to engage with the population and you can't just empty the city um, and then approach IEDs as if there's nobody around. Um, I think you know, what we saw in Iraq, there were a lot of lessons on how to reduce the impact of IEDs on either the population. Take, you know, Al-Qaeda loved using vehicle-borne IEDs and it has been a, a trend of, with ISIS um, to cause mass casualty events. And that you can, there are strategies to reduce that. Whether you use concrete barriers, you cut off roads, um, you you start to remove um, populations or relocate populations to reduce the ability for those IEDs to cause mass effects. But that, but there's, I mean, even in the Battle of Mosul, they, I mean, they IED'd the roads. You know, ISIS was heavy in vehicle-borne IEDs, so it, it didn't create new tactics. Whether it's you know, putting a bulldozer down a street before you go down it, um, so that you know vehicles that can take an ID blast beforehand. But so in an urban environment, you have to tell me what the conditions are. Is it 
still populated? Are we in a counterinsurgency? Can the population help us identify where the IEDs are? Is it just a fight on urban terrain where there's not as many people, but you're you're having to go into the terrain that's heavily IED'd? And then I think you're, you'll be heavily on you know engineer support and bulldozers um, and those really kind of ancient type of tactics that we've seen repopulate, re-establish or be needed again. I mean, the amount of bulldozers they needed in Mosul was huge. And one of the main reasons was just they can take an IED blast. How is the United States preparing its soldiers and leadership for the upcoming challenges in urban warfare, namely drones, defeating counter OSINT operations, coordination to quickly respond and converge on emerging threats in urban environments, and IEDs? Yeah, great question. And it's, again, what I do, um, I think some of the biggest ways that the, the, the U.S. Army has got a new operating concept called the multi-domain battle. They just came out with a new one. It's a 2.0. You can look it up. But it adds in there operations in ditch urban terrain, which I, I was really happy to see. And I think that's a direct correlation of support to operations in Mosul and other battles where even General Townsend, who's in charge of Army training and doctrine, was the, the commander in charge of that um, coalition elements to support that operation. And he brought those lessons back. So what we're seeing is a big investment in developing new concepts that will apply to these dense urban environments, um, building up our urban training center out in – whether it's in California for the Army or the Marines, um, and then major investments also in technologies that will help. You know, And I try to help with my own research and, and point people in the right direction of where certain investments might help. But I think there's a lot of work to be done, but I'm really happy that the U.S. Army and – and the U.S. military in general have identified as a major problem that we have to start um, developing better capabilities for. How does U.S. policy on urban warfare change when applied to great power conflicts? The recent wars we've seen uh, are all uh, in an urban setting have all been counterinsurgency operations in relatively small cities. But take the massive megacities in China. How on earth would the U.S. even start to try to fight in an environment like Shanghai or Hong Kong? How would they handle the humanitarian issues? Has there been extensive thought put into this? I do think there's been extensive thought. I don't um, – yeah, so we have these big war games where we, we try to imagine the, the biggest enemy, the biggest threat, whether it's China, Russia, and then where we think the battle is going to happen, whether that's um, an you know, approach into an urban area, but – uh, back to the you know why how militaries plan, we're still planning to avoid for all the right reasons, avoid urban areas where possible, and but most you know combatant commanders in the U.S. military have plans for all the different scenarios that can be imagined. Um, in you know the U.S. Pacific Command has so many different megacities, they've done a lot of work, a lot of conferences, and a lot of work on this full range of operations. Whether it was a natural disaster in in a you know in Shanghai or a major operation outside of it, most but most battles um, that people foresee, and I, I almost agree with them in some aspects, aren't starting in the urban area. They may you know regress back into the urban area, but even if you look at China, you know China's investments in anti-area denial, they want to engage any threat, you know whoever it is, as far at, out as possible. Because they don't want, you know, they don't want battles happening within their cities and where their populations are under threat. They want to, um, and they have invested heavily in their navy and anti-air denial aspects so that those battles don't happen. Can you just? Defi- oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, if a nation state versus nation state battle happens in an urban area, which is, I think, unlikely in my, in my mind, it's it's going to be as destructive as we saw in the World War II battles. Can you give us your definition or a definition for a megacity? I abide by the United Nations definition of megacities, which is an urban area with a population of over 10 million. Now, I agree that there are many problems with that definition, even the one of density. Um, But that is the United Nations definition of a, a population or residence of over 10 million. How can we improve the foraging abilities of modern mechanized militaries? During the 19th century, states routinely defeated insurgent, force, insurgent forces. Uh, in the 20th century, however, this pattern reversed itself, with states increasingly less likely to defeat insurgents or avoid meeting at least some of their demands. What accounts for this pattern of outcomes in counterinsurgency wars? Yeah, I think the history of 
Um, and there's a couple of scholars even within my institution, the Modern War Institute, that look at that, whether it's Sri Lanka, Vietnam, you name the counterinsurgencies that most um, counterinsurgencies fail. But to, when do you, you say, okay, there's been a victory and when there hasn't been and whether where the tactics used to defeat the counterinsurgency, especially you know post-World War II, post-Vietnam, um, globally accepted international norms of um, what is the right – protection of humanitarian um you know all the different common law uh, organizations on how do you fight a counterinsurgency I, I thought this question was starting with the logistics on how to how to uh, forage for your own supplies which is a great topic um most militaries think that they, they're going to bring things into the environment where that wasn't the way in past battles where you you foraged or you had to acquire whether it's fuel food or water from within the environment and urban areas make that severely complex as you don't want to take from the population to support yourselves. But I don't have the answers on how to successfully win a counterinsurgency, but I wouldn't say that the, the trend, and I think there's been some good books out there to say that the trend of counterinsurgencies is that most nation states lose against that because then you start, it's really hard to draw the line between warfare and internal defense and policing. Why do you think the U.S. is so consistently engaged in JSOC-type operations? These kind of actions seem to implicate some form of collateral damage that undoes whatever hearts and minds or civil affairs-type influence more conventional troops set out to do. Yeah, Matt, that's a tough topic because you know the perceptions of how much or the of operations are JSOC or Joint Special Operations Command operations, and which um how many are other types of organizations. Um, it's hard to determine because classified, unclassified, open source, um, what is known and what is not. Um, but I, I can tell you that the U.S. military and the U.S. Americans take heavily into consideration any operation and the effects that the operation may or may not have into the, the nation. And most operations are done in, in conjunction with the nation and the nation asking for support. I mean, I think we have, you know, po post, um, not even post 9/11, but you know, post post 9/11, the global war on terrorism, you saw an increase in um, striking these organizations who have ex not only a, an insurgent mind to attack the nation, but to attack the globe as a you know global caliphate ideology or whatever. Um, you saw you've seen an increase in attacks on them, and successfully being able to stop their capacity to strike other nations or you know U.S. or any other nation. The U.K. had a, you know the U.K. Spain everybody's as these organizations continue to try to cause harm, you've seen an increase in counterterrorism operations, not just the U.S., but to keep those operations from having effects. So it's, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a tough question, but it's also, I wouldn't say that the, the operations don't take into consideration the effect that they'll have on the, the political environment or the local environment where the operation is going to be had. Is the notion of victory in all but conventional warfare an outdated one, at least for the U.S., given that asymmetrical tactics favor insurgents and terrorists against countries like ours? I wouldn't say the victory is – you know, we teach this at, at West Point, and you, you have to tell me what people are saying is their definition of victory. My definition of victory is always – especially from – you talk military strategy is bringing the other side to a political um, agreement. So you know, most people still have an attritional mindset and victory in their mind, but I can tell you that's not the mindset that the U.S. military has or the U.S. government has. I think that the, I think that's kind of a common term that's just used. You, you're not going to defeat ISIS. Well, there is no victory over an insurgent ideology. There is victory on either creating stability in a country to where the level of violence is, you know not as high as it was before or bringing the other party to a political settlement. And I think that's what you've seen in Afghanistan where you know, they're trying to bring Taliban to the um, political settlement where people can agree on governance and shared um, elements of power. I don't think that if you're a student of strategic studies, the term victory is needs updating, but I think the kind of global or especially media use of the word victory or success is just not keeping up with the right definitions. How viable is combat air support going forward into the new century, given both the high and low-tech threats we now face? 
Yeah, it, it's it's complex. And again, militaries are designed to fight other militaries, so most of their air support is going to be in conjunction with that. But I think the question is right, especially where I study the environment, the urban environment, the ability. That's why the the people insurgents or non-state actors want to go into the urban environment because the whoever the military is, their ability to provide air support to their forces on the ground is reduced within the urban area. So, and the investments that most air forces are investing in are not in continued air support of ground forces. They're more um, strategic strike or um, other capabilities. So it's a great question, and even we we struggle in the U.S. military in the reduction of our A-10 air support um, to ground forces capabilities. But luckily, we've maintained those. But I agree, and I think I think the low threat part of that question is talking about the the challenge to air superiority that we've seen in recent battles, and I, I think that has been a uh, hopefully we have a question about that is a, is an issue that we've never seen since World War II. How does a nation state defend itself from the hybrid warfare strategy employed by Russia and non-state actors most likely affiliated with Russia in eastern Ukraine? Uh, so the, the, the first part of that question is how do you defend yourself against the hybrid warfare is one. But then how do you, you know, when you pin that down into eastern Europe where the, the political reasons for the conflicts that have been had are m- more than most people want to talk about on um, you know, what is the underlying cause of the conflict, whether Russia views it as a eastern expansion of NATO or in, uh, in disagreement to settlements that were, happen- that were had post-World War II, or do you view it as um, you know, in- encouraging on to recognize political nations? How do you defend yourself against hybrid warfare? It's, it's tough, and that the point of hybrid warfare is not – it's meant to be below the level of conflict – that gets into internationally accepted rules of conflict um, and attribution is really hard and your involvement in upsetting the political environment there um, I think that it has to go with all the forms of power whether it's diplomatic information technologies economic and military so a lot of the Eastern European countries that and I know you had um, you know Colonel uh, yeah, Colonel Rita Salo yeah from Finland and, and you asked him questions about Finland and Poland and the how do you combat um, hybrid warfare against someone like Russia is you establish relationships. So a lot of times people don't want to talk about having a relationship with the quote unquote enemy, but that's the way nations work. And you have relationships with um, other countries. I mean, Russians involvement in Syria is is their tactic to reduce the level of violence and keep their economic stability from a neighboring country that they need. So if you're in Eastern Europe, it's a you know that diplomatic form of power is huge in combating hybrid warfare is um, establishing relationships with a lot of people. And I think NATO still has a huge role, in st- which kind of is the backbone to what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in, in Eastern Europe. From urban warfare to drones, how much of a game changer are small weaponized drones? How will future drone development change war? Yeah, that's a great question. I, mean, I don't know if it, I'd say it's a game changer. It was a I think I think it, it was a surprise as a, um, especially the Iraqi Iraqi military entering a lot of the besieged cities and the the use of ISIS, um, the use of ISIS and the unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, I don't know if I'd say it's a game changer in warfare. I think it was a consideration that a lot of people weren't didn't think were as advanced as possible, and the use of drones. Um, most of the ones that were used, though, required some type of military capability, military munition. I, um, I think it will still be a challenge um, against, but it's not just drones. As the democratization of technology and open source technologies, use of GPS. Um, um, we've seen a lot of other things that scare me just as much as drones do, but I think drones did surprise everybody. It was the first time since World War II that many militaries, to include the U.S. military, had to look up. And there was not air, air superiority. I think that the level of investments that the military has made in countering those is quite advanced um, because those many of those systems, although you know, it's, any time you have warfare and the ID fight is just the same, it's this kind, it's, it's this constant reaction, counter reaction, you know, defeat. Um, they evolve and then you, you defeat it again. I and I don't think. It's one of these revolutions in military affairs that we talk about within our studies, and you know, like the airplane, 
the tank, the machine gun. I don't think drones are at that level. I think they're being played with. Um, I would you know, point to more swarm technologies and the use of artificial intelligence as something that has the potential to changing. Uh, and that's why you see a lot of countries, China, uh, China specifically investing in artificial intelligence. Um, I think those are more potential game changers than the use of hobby drones um, and the ability to defeat those and the kind of action counter reaction that's happening on with current things that always happens in warfare it's lost to point through but i think that did take people back but i don't think it's the game changer what is the expected timeline of actual robot drone swarms being deployed in urban warfare when do you think if at all autonomous ai ground and air drones will take over high-risk missions in urban warfare uh so i for i don't think for there's a timeline Again, if, a lot of people do future gazing, and most people get it wrong. Um, I don't think I could put a timeline on it. I, I, we have autonomous systems, and a really good book, um, Army of None, um, that talks about this, about what what's out there that's already autonomous, fully autonomous, or, and what people think is autonomous and that's not. And when there's still a human in the loop, I don't think that you'll see a fully autonomous killer robot anytime in the near future. Just because we still, have, we as a, you know, especially an international community, have to get through the ethics of when is it okay to have a system that is able to implement violence, which is you know the ultimate means, without a human in a loop. Um, and there are very few systems out there right now that that have that. I mean, there's some naval capabilities. You know, a mine is an autonomous system, but I think the question is more about you know kill a robot. I don't see that in the next 20 to 40 years, not some without a human in a loop. In the week before Christmas, uh, the UK's Gatwick Airport was shut down for most of three days due to what appears to have been a privately owned drone being flown over the airfield, leading to tens of millions in lost revenue and significant disruption. No one has been arrested, and it appears the UK police are incapable of handling the situation. Does public access to modern advanced technology present a threat on home soil? If a lone wolf can have such an impact, how much damage could a squad of determined operators do? Um, good, good topic. Um, and I do think that most police, just by their function, aren't prepared for that threat. Um, and it's this happens throughout warfare as well, where stuff on the battlefield, you know. Is, is evolved and then it makes it into civil communities and then you start to see it. Um, I, I, I did observe that and I think that the military capabilities, which is interesting, so the, you know, the, the use of hobby drones increased in warfare, but then the capability to defeat them increased, but the, you know, the law enforcement didn't have those capabilities because they didn't need them. So I think you'll see that now in some of your, your especially your airports where a drone could cause significant damage, um, as opposed to we've seen Mexican cartels using drones for, you know, a whole range of illegal activities. Um, and I think that that will be a continuing involvement, just like in warfare, for law enforcement. And there's there's great relationships between law enforcement and military communities, and those capabilities, since they're so open source, and that any a criminal could could use it. But even in the drone in Gatwick, you know, it was a it was just it was a drone that could cause damage, but it wasn't a weaponized drone. Um, so it's a matter of where we see that in civilian communities. But I think that shared relationship of any nation state in its military and its law enforcement without militarizing your law enforcement, which is always the other end of the question. But the you know, those cap those capabilities and it's a it's a two way relationship. Mo many of the, mil the capabilities that the military has came from either fire departments or law enforcement, especially in the urban environments, whether it's how to open a door. Um, you know, how to do urban policing came from the law enforcement and, and given to the military. So I think that 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 shared information will help. And in, in especially we've already seen it in, in the UK where they're asking the military to first respond, you know, to be there to respond is why. And that's one of the reasons you have your military for national defense and the internal defense. So you'd, you know, for us, we'd, we'd ask for federal assistance from the National Guard because they have these advanced capabilities that the law enforcement don't need, but now they need it. So one, you ask for help, and then you ask for the, the capabilities, and that capabilities continue to evolve. So I, 
I mean, potentially you'll see many airports now have some type of anti-drone capability, um, but it gets tricky, and I think you know that because of the radar, um, the airplanes need it, but so do the drones. How do you see drones changing combat? Will drones replace pilots? Uh, what other applications are there that you can see, foresee? How would the use of drones in warfare, or how, how will it evolve in the next 10 years? I think, so I, I think the most, I think it will change a lot of aspects of warfare, um, but not necessarily the, the um, application of violence. I think drones will be seen a lot in um, resupply, which, you, if you, as you know, you know, especially in a, a non-high intensity combat fight where the threat is mostly to your lines of su communication and lines of supply, as you saw in Iraq, you know, for many years of the insurgency, the threat was to those non-combat MOSs who were just trying to move convoys along streets. Um, and if you can use drones to resupply forces, you can use drones to um, bring in medical care. I think you'll see a heavy investment, and I think those are some of the major changes you'll see in warfare is the investment of drones just to reduce the kind of all, all of our interest is to reduce the threat to the military and the civilians. We see a lot of those activities transferred into drone um, or aerial resupplies and, and autonomous vehicle supplies um, and convoys, which reduce the threat and the kind of the reduce the number of targets that especially an insurgent non-state actor would, would have access to. How do we prevent terrorists from using store-bought or internet-bought drones? Is there any uh, uh, convergence between uh, drones and IEDs that you would foresee becoming a real threat in the future? Oh, yeah. And we saw that. And, we, and that's what we've seen. And that's why the investments in counter um, drone technologies has been so big because, like I said, we, I think a lot of people were, supply, were uh, surprised because a drone that can see you is one thing. Which you know is different in warfare, where you the ability for you to move unseen is much less, not just because of drones, but because of cell phone technologies. But you know those drones, which I think are the the higher threat, are the drones that have been weaponized in some way, whether it's you know a forty millimeter grenades attached to them and they can drop it, or it's a fast moving drone um, which has some type of homemade explosive into it, where it's basically a flying rocket that they can. Uh, and we've seen all of that. But, you know, how do you defeat them? Just like the ID, you, you invest in technologies to defeat the device itself, but then you also invest in abilities to break down the network. You don't have somebody who has the capability to weaponize a drone that can defeat countermeasures without having some type of, you know, network in there, whether that's the bomb maker, the, the supplier of the advanced bombs. And I think we'll see that evolution just like we did in IEDs where you you have to invest in the countermeasures and invest in force protection, but then you invest in attacking the network. And we saw a lot of that um, where these you you can't necessarily be. I mean, it's the difference between a cyber attack and the attribution versus a device like this. Then we'll start breaking down the network. And I think you can reduce the number of threats by that. How will urban warfare change with the increasing use of cyber tools? What is the convergence between cyber warfare and urban warfare? Uh, we always like to say, you know, warfare happens. Um, it's a people, it's a human event uh, event that happens where the people are. I mean, you have battles where people are. So I think that's where cyber comes in effect, um, especially along the level of conflict you're talking about, and you know, especially hybrid warfare where information technology, <coughs> information technology, and cyber warfare, or like we've seen with the Russian use of cyber attacks before in it, a, a real, you know, a basically a physical attack. I think that integration, and that's why I think you know the U.S. military kind of went to this multi-domain op operations concept, where you're going to have all these different domains: the air, the sea, the cyber, um, either being used independently or you know before actual what people would think is actual combat, but it's all combat. Um, I think it's cyber comes into effect in many ways, whether it's in the information operations, um, deception, uh, or the physical. You know, pre-physical attack component of like shutting down power systems, shutting down um, the ability to get information out. But it's it's really what warfare has been before. You, you saw it in World War II, and you know, electromagnetic spectrum has always been contested. But now, because of the, I think the the what we call the signal 
amount of signals there is, it becomes extremely complex. But what we've seen the Russians do is, you know, in this, especially in this hybrid proxy or, you know, trying to act like it's not happening, cyber is, is a major component of the conflict. Is the state of the U.S. electricity grid a uh, serious risk to national security? Several years ago, there was a Russian cyber attack on the Estonian power grid, uh, which compromised their public services. Uh, how prepared are we for such threats? I wouldn't say it's a it's a um, because I, I think we people know that it's a threat. You know whether it's you know a power grid or a nuclear power site, which you know whether you look at the use of the Stuxnets in, in Iran. I don't think it's a major threat to national security, but it's one that we always, in our national security priorities, it's it's a top priority. But each one of those um, fields has a kind of a protection plan, and they have different names. And there has been heavy investments and in thinking into protecting all of our um, internal security things, whether it's a port operation or a power grid. Um, the national security plan. There are individual plans within each one of those. I don't. I wouldn't say it's an say upper level one. I mean, I think cyber attacks on our economic system are a, a bigger threat than cyber attacks on a power system, especially within the United States. But it's all. They're all threats that you have to weigh your um, investments in. But you know whether you invest in cyber defense or cyber offense. Um, I think the it, U.S. has invested heavily in defense, especially of critical infrastructure like power, um, energy, nuclear sites, all that. Is it possible to build up the cybersecurity sector without appearing to be engaged in offensive uh, uh, investments? Yeah, that's a tough one, um, especially since most of the cyber um, battlefield is civilian owned and not military owned. So yes, you can, yes, it is possible to build up your cyber capabilities, and I think all countries are doing that. Um, some may be ahead of the U.S. and some may not be. I mean, it's so hard to tell because you know it's, it's all classified. I think the biggest investment that can be made and the buildups that can be made, and we've seen this uh, really good book called Like War kind of gets into this, is the building the private and public relationships. But since so much of this is happening on the civilian battle space, the civilian-owned networks and routers, and um, although, you know, the internet was created by the, the government. It, it's definitely not a government function. Um, those relationships have to be so shared that it's changing kind of the nature of civilian organizations' role in quote unquote war or warfare or national security. I think that's the buildup that needs to be done while you're building your cyber offensive capabilities. How do you think cyber war and cyber attacks will evolve over the next decade or two? And what influence do they have on politics and how we understand what an attack is and how we respond? Yeah, I actually don't have a prediction on, again, prediction is always wrong. Um, I think history is your biggest predictor and, and what we've seen in just very recent history is, and I think the bigger threat to national security is not the cyber use in conjunction with military action, but it is that cyber use in influencing political environments. And the U.S. has struggled with that immensely and they're we're still trying to figure it out on how do you prevent this new it's something that's always happened in, in nation states espionage and in, you know influencing another nation without having to do much um cyber has kind of blown the lid on that ability of an, another nation to influence the nation it wants to using cyber capabilities um whether it's social media and controlling a narrative and i think the U.S. is really, most nations, especially ones that adhere to, like we said earlier, to internationally accepted norms of what is okay and what is not. Cyber is is not the, you know, the quote-unquote gray zone, but it is this very complex situation where a lot, a lot of us are struggling on what do we do? Do we act like them and influence their nation narratives, um, build up your defenses so you can identify when it's happening, just like we have with knowing that Russia inter interfered with the and the elections and the the narratives on both sides um, purposely, um, I think I think that woke people up. So I think the ability to do that is less now than it was before. But like I said, that that book, Light War, really helps set the stage on what would need to happen and in the involvement of 
civilian organizations and helping to identify when it is another nation trying to influence, um, whether it's a bot factory or you know false accounts or fake news, um, which are all real things that you had. It's the new battlefield that we all have to fight in that we didn't have to before. Is America behind in the development of countermeasures and deterrence in the realm of cyber war? Are there cyber a attacks that could realistically result in a kinetic response? I don't think that the U.S. is behind. I think the U.S. is struggling with the uh, release authorities for all of these capabilities, especially cyber. So I don't think we're behind in capability. I think I wouldn't. I would even call it behind. I think everybody's struggling from um, on what is the release authorities for the use of these capabilities, depending on what the mission is. Um, and that's, I think, even the international community as a whole has to um, struggle with these questions on what is okay for a nation to be using um, at the kind of tactical level, um, whether it's in warfare or just normal day-to-day -day operations. Um, how do you bring it to an international body if it is, you know, attribution and and, and do payback when the very nature of these operations cause it to not be attribution or even it not to be provable. Um, I think we're not struggling capabilities, we're struggling in use in authorities and international laws for the use of these capabilities. In a large conflict between major powers, will carrier task groups be as valuable as in previous conflicts or do hypersonic cruise missiles and offensive cyber capabilities render them largely redundant? No, I think I think they're still very important, um, even from the, the the sheer nation state or nation state deterrence factor um, of having NATO capabilities. Of course, everybody's in a you know, you're, you're always in a race to, um, and like we talked about earlier, in China's continual push outward to create this um, air denial system where they can engage you to where you're not even going to get close to them. And hypersonics is it's kind of the new race for that. Um, so you can't defeat certain missile types because of the speed of their operations, but I don't think they any of those new technologies eliminate the need to have naval power or any of those capabilities. Just one for the the fact that that hypersonics is not as far as evolved as a lot of people try to say they are in the news. Um, but you know, all all your investments in military are you have a major deterrence capability on what can you do and what you can't do, and I don't think that hypersonics or any other missile technology eliminates the need for any of the current uh, naval forces. What does the introduction of Russia's avant-garde mean for the U.S.? Is Russia's new hypersonic missile a big worry or do we have something for that? Yeah, we go in, we'd go into classified. I don't, I think it's a concern and everybody, yeah, they're doing what everybody else does. Everybody wants to to create overmatch, what we call overmatch, to, in a capability. It doesn't that be, you know, some people can't invest in soldiers, so they invest in um, other capabilities, whether it's cyber or missile technologies, um, and that's the constant race of all nation states. Um, the, you know, the U.S. military, U.S., the United States invests heavily in its military to to have that overmatch as one of the, you know, as as a global force um, um, to. You know, for many reasons, and we can go into those. I, I think that you know, if I was a small military, I would be doing the same. I would be investing in technologies that give me an overmatch in certain areas, so that way I, I don't have to invest in as much in my ground forces, and I'm investing more in my naval forces, depending on what my role is. Is is, is my role to, you know, to have the ability to strike others, or just for internal defense, or you know, like China, is it just to create this barrier that you know, lets them be who they are? We had the Asia pivot. Uh, is it realistic to suggest that the next major theater of uh, war or at least geopolitical tension will be East Asia? What is your opinion on this? Uh, specifically, what threat does China pose uh, for the next century? Uh, so I'm not a big believer in creating threats that aren't there. Um, I, you know, we had the pivot. I, I think that's been misinterpreted on many levels. Um, you know, it's, it's just a, a refocus of national security on, you know, terrorism versus the biggest threat, which is, in, you know, threats to national security, whether it's economic threats, which are huge. And I think that's one of the major reasons that China can be, can, you know, quote unquote, a threat is, you know, in its stealing of international property and the threats to economic 
national interests, which I, I think are major, and, and you need militaries to protect that, whether it's protecting the, the global commons on the Navy, the naval um, backbone that relies on protecting the global commons, or you know, just keeping them, you know, people in line to your what your national interests are. I don't think that the next, next battle will be a major battle in East Asia or a, ne- a, a major battle against China, frankly. And I think that's the advantage to our post kind of World War II you know, new globalized world is we all have economic, diplomatic um, relationships with all these countries that that prevent conflict, uh, especially major conflicts, because we all have, you know, China has economic interests in the United States and Europe and everywhere, and so do we. So those are all the forms of power, but you always want the capability to prepare for the worst situation, and that's what you invest in. Do we take the Thucydides trap seriously? Is the rising power destined to clash with the established power? Yeah, I like, I really do, I mean, it's hard to argue against, you know, what Graham Allison has presented in his book on the Thucydides trap and looking at history. And it did, it was I mean, very interesting to look at. And I agree that a, if people understand why, why nations go to war, you know, whether it's, you know, fear, anger, pride, um, interest, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very valid argument to look across history and say that that misperception of another rising country, which, you know, if you look at the media, in, <clears throat> whether it's Russian artillery capabilities or China military capabilities, that perceived rise of another nation, like he points out in the, you know, Athens versus Greece or Athens versus the Spartans. If we perceive um, another nation is achieving overmatch over us, will it drive the conflict? I, I think it's a very good, um, but I think it discounts the new age of diplomacy that we have and the economic ties that we have that are have been created by globalization. Um, it's hard to argue against what the analysis that he's put out there in the long view, especially the long view, <clears throat> where a perceived um, threat from a major nation state that creates um, a, mili- a threat could lead to a conflict. I don't have the right answer for that one, <clears throat> but I think it discounts kind of our complex diplomatic and globalized economic connections. What is the most important geographic strength of the United States? It's been argued that two oceans, two mountain ranges, the Chesapeake Bay and San Francisco Bay, and complete control of the Mississippi were the most important. What future what feature do you think is most important? That's a good question. Yeah, I think that the oceans and the the separation between any any threat is the biggest um, geographic separation between a lot of other nations who border a threat. Um, you know, we don't border a threat, so we have the advantage. You know, you could talk about Alaska and, and its um, border ranges, but for the most part, we we are an island, um, so we have that the oceans separate us. But I think our biggest counter to any geographic threat is just force projection and our ability our ability to project force across the globe. And not many militaries in the nation have or want that capability and we've decided that that's part of our national defense is this ability to, to force project whether it's you know missile technologies or just military force projection across the globe and, that, and that's a major strength that we have that ties into our geographic strengths what advice would you give to young officers in the military today about leadership coming from the enlisted side what did you see that made great officers and what made bad officers uh, that's a PhD in itself. Um, I mean, I learned a lot from going from enlisted to officer. Um, the biggest advice is for me now, after all my experiences, is this ability to be open to, um, and we have within the U.S. military, but most militaries have this really great relationship between experience and officership, your experience of your non-commissioned officers and your officers. And an officer that understands he's in charge, but is also open to advice from other experienced soldiers, whether it's the lowest soldier to the his counterpart, non-commissioned officer. I think that ability to be open, but also be in charge is probably the biggest thing that I learned from my 25 years of career. You mentioned a couple of books. You mentioned uh, Paul Shari's Army of None and P.W. Singer's Like War. Uh, what else are you reading? What should we be reading that relates to geopolitics, the military, or urban warfare? 
Yeah, that's a, I'm a I'm an avid reader. Um, I mean, just sitting on my desk right here is Blood War by Kill Cullen, um, which was a great short read about, and I learned a lot on what led into the, the growth of ISIS and especially in capabilities to take down a city. Um, I also have uh, Lawrence Friedman's Strategy, which is an amazing but really book, really big book on um, helping you understand the, the, the evolution of strategy in the military, but also in the civilian world. But really opened my eyes up to some of the theories that we have on national strategy and the use of militaries. Um, you know, I read a lot of urban stuff, um, and there's not that much out there, which is lucky for me. That means I can write and have, have some good opinions. Um, there's a really good book that I highly recommend to anybody, especially that ever wants to read, read about urban warfare. Is a book called Block by Block. It's an urban anthology of, of all, multiple urban battles that was put out by the Combat Studies Institute for the U.S. Army. Um, it's a really good book on if you want to understand the future of urban warfare, you got to look to the past. Not that I'm a historian, but I mean, that's the biggest predictor of the way the military is going to approach it in the future is the way they did in the past. Um, and that's a really good book. I mean, I'm, I think right now I, what uh, the book that I, I'm reading, what's the name of it? Uh, I'm, I'm still getting through Army of None, like you said. If uh, we want to follow you, where should we look? Twitter? Yeah, so I'm a. On Twitter at uh, Spencer Guard, uh, S P N C E R, just Guard like you'd think it Guard is. Um, and then our my, our website, the Modern War Institute, it's mwi.usma.edu. Um, I have a you know page there that has all my listings of my publications and everything. But I mainly you know Twitter is probably the best one. All right. Well, uh, Major John Spencer, thank you very much. Thanks, Dan.